mushroom hunting is becoming a really popular pastime in the United States. With more people going out and going mushroom hunting, comes a lot more people getting poisoned by not knowing what they're doing when they're out in the woods, not knowing how to identify a mushroom, or not knowing where to go get them identified. Having been trying to identify mushrooms myself for going on about three years now, I've come to learn that there are a lot of mushrooms that look tasty. They look edible. They look like they would just be absolutely delicious, but are very deceiving. Still yet, there are mushrooms that look like other mushrooms, and you can't tell them apart very easily unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Mushrooms are used for different reasons all across the world. Some are used for food or as a spice. Some are used for dyeing clothing. Still yet, others are used as medicine. There are a lot of people out there who claim to know what they're talking about when it comes to mushroom poison and mushroom edibility. But I would encourage anyone and everyone to further their research, to don't just take one person's word for it. So after you watch this video today, just because you heard me say that these species are poisonous or toxic, you know, don't take just my word for it. Go out and do more research. You know, there's people that will tell you that, hey, you ate a lethal mushroom or you ate a poisonous mushroom, but it's okay. That's not a very lethal dose. You'll be okay. Those kind of people should never be listened to. That is not very sound advice. Uh, complications can come with eating these uh, deadly mushrooms other than just reaching that lethal dosage, that LD of that certain toxic in the mushrooms. People will have complications in, uh, in smaller doses of the, the toxin that can lead to organ failure. So today we're going to talk about some of those deadly mushrooms, what they look like, what they may smell like, how to identify them from something that looks similar to them. That way you'll know what to look for. You can do some more research on them and you'll know what might kill you or may even kill your animals. Hiding amongst the ferns, we have something extremely deadly. This is a destroying angel, also known as Amanita bisporgera. Amanita bisporgera is a very deceiving mushroom. It's this beautiful, ghostly, angelic, divine white color with no scales on the cap like other Amanitas you may have seen. Underneath here, you've got this ring. At the base, we're going to have a sac-like vulva. I'll dig that up in a moment. Notice on the stem here, you've got decorations of almost like chevrons that go down. That's another key factor for an Amanita bisporgera. Try to dig it up here. Oh, there you can see. There's the vulva. So let's dig it out with the knife. Here's that vulval sac at the bottom of an Amanita bisporgera. You gotta carefully excavate an Amanita or that'll get lost in the ground. Got that ring here. The ring is what usually colors the gills whenever it's very young. Usually there will be a ring that goes around the top of the stem there, in between the stem and the gills, because the gills don't usually touch. This omni is a little bit atypical and actually has slightly decurrent gills. I'm going to take some of this 5% potassium hydroxide solution and drop it onto the cap. And omni the bisporgera will turn yellow. There you go. Omni the bisporgera isn't the only destroying angel that we have in our area. Um, I've also come across Amanita magna valeris, which um, does not turn yellow with the co on the cap. So with Amanitas, you're going to want to stay away from them because of the potential toxins in them. I mean, this one is absolutely deadly if ingested because it has what are called amatoxins in them. Foliotina rugosa or Conosabi rugosa, also used to be called Conosabi filaris, uh, doesn't really have a common name, but you'll find these growing on the ground or in, in leaf litter in hardwood forests. They have this small cap. It's usually about one to two centimeters wide. Brown caps that are actually wrinkly. Their stem is very small, one to three millimeters wide. It'll have a ring on the stem that can have grooves on the top. The cap is hygrophonous as well. It will lose color as it dries out. The stem is brownish and it's going to have these filibrils all up and down it. It's, it's a very small mushroom, uh, easily overlooked, but it's very deadly with the amatoxins that are present in it. Here underneath these, uh, we got a tulip poplar, I see some birch, uh, rhododendron, so lots of hardwoods right here. 
we've got what looks like Inosibe or Inosibe sororia, uh, now known as Pseudosperma sororia. It's in the family Inosibaceae. Uh, common name is the corn silk fiber head. You can see how the cap kind of has these fibrous, this fibrous look that goes uh, like from the middle of the cap to the outside of the cap. So just like strings that go from the middle to the outside. So maybe here in some slightly better lighting, you can see the strings that I'm talking about. One thing that sets this one apart is that it's this, this tan color instead of a dark brown. Its gills are going to be uh, kind of, they can turn, they're whitish at first, but they turn like a grayish color and eventually may have a greenish color to them. See this base here? It's slightly bulbous. And its smell, it's going to be slightly spermatic or mealy in um, in the way that it smells. And that's that's where the, the genus Pseudosperma comes from. Inosibaceae typically has a brown spore print. This one will as well. You can even kind of see where the gills are getting like a brown color to them where they're starting to have mature spores on the underside there. But this is, Inosibaceae is one of those uh, genus that it's important to get you an odor profile. So that spermatic odor, it's, it's pretty important in, in distinguishing between different uh, or genus in the family Inosibaceae. Look at the fibrous cap there. It's called Rimos. Here are a couple of other examples of what an Inosibaceae can look like. You've got that little nipple on the cap there you can see the the fibers on the cap on this one too the underside here you can see that it's still pretty white but when you smell them yeah, these are spermatic again so i uh, got a slightly bulbous base so these are probably in that pseudosperma uh, genus again. Here's what I suspect to be the other destroying angel that we have in our area, Amanita magnavalaris. So what we'll do is we're going to test this with some KOH to see if it turns yellow, and if it does not turn yellow, that's a good indicator. Also, this thick skirt uh, or ring on the on the stem here is a good indicator, and also this really thick felty vulva is another good indicator. So here's the moment of truth. Remember, if it does not turn yellow, then this is going to be Amanita magnavalaris. It is not turning yellow. So this is the destroying angel that does not turn yellow with KOH. Still has those amatoxins in it. You do not want to eat this. I know white's a pretty color. It may look attractive, but this is deadly toxic. Gallerina marginata, or Gallerina marginata, also known as the funeral bell, has a brown cap. It's hygrophonous, so it loses color as it dries out. The stem can be whitish to reddish brown to brownish and has a very weak, uh, flimsy ring or ring zone on it that covers its gills whenever it's very young. It can be found in hardwood or conifer forests on the wood itself, uh, growing gregariously to even uh, clustered at times. Uh, the cap does not have any hairs or anything on it, and it's uh, rounded on the top and sometimes becomes flat. The gills are widely attached to uh, slightly decurrent down the stem. The mycelium is white at the base of the stem. Uh, you can see some of these little pins here. They can be very, very tiny. The caps are 1.5 centimeters to 5 centimeters wide. And they're often mistaken for enoki mushrooms, um, flamulina velutypes. People go hunting for these all the time at this time of year in the, in the spring and the fall. Spore print is rusty brown. And what do we have here? We've got some orange mushrooms growing directly from the base of a tree, which appears to be some type of oak. So here is one of these beautiful clusters of orange mushrooms growing off this oak tree. Looking at that oak leaf, it's probably a type of red oak. Um, but a lot of people mistake these for chanterelle mushrooms. These are not deadly toxic, but these are poisonous. If you ingest them, you will get sick. So these are recognizable because they're orange on the cap. They are orange underneath 
on the gills and the stem. The gills are slightly decurrent. They have true gills as opposed to false gills like a chanterelle. So these, these gills here, they'll be sharp on the edge, kind of like a knife. Um, with a chanterelle, you'll break it open and peel it down the center, and it'll peel apart like string cheese and be white in the center. These here will not be white. Let me show you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and rip one of these open, and it'll show you that it doesn't really rip like string cheese. There are a couple strings there, but they're, they adhere much better in an actual chanterelle. But see how the inside is totally orange. Totally orange. Not white at all like a chanterelle. So there you have it. This is a jack-o'-lantern mushroom, also known as Omphalotus illudens. They call it the jack-o'-lantern mushroom because it will glow in the dark at night. And you can see it with the naked eye. Um, capturing it on a camera is very difficult unless you have some kind of a big fancy camera that can do long exposures. Um, but these mushrooms glow in the dark because of a chemical called, chemical called luciferin. So there's a, another interesting tidbit. Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms. So here we have the button stage of Amanita muscaria. You can see that it's just now starting to elongate. It's not even really showing any of the stem yet. But it's got this, these little patchy areas on the cap here. And the stem is pretty patchy too. A little bit older, you start to see some of these patches break up on the cap. The stem is still pretty much connected to that cap. You start to see some of the concentric rings around the base of the stem. It continues to age, it's going to have these warts that start to become more pronounced on the cap. It's going to keep this yellow orange color. It's going to start to separate from the stem somewhat. I'm going to keep those concentric rings around the base there. This decorated stem. See the ring still hanging on. Continues to age. It's going to open up some more. Got that typical umbrella shape. The bottom starting to get those really nice concentric zones on the bottom of the stem. The ring has finally let go. As it ages, it may start to lose parts of its cap from being broken by the natural reasons or animals maybe chewing on them. Still, it's got the ring here that's falling down. It's not up there anymore. But the rings, or the, the gills, they're not attached to the stem on Amanita muscaria, or any Amanita for that matter. See how they don't really touch? As it gets older, it will start to turn inside out looking. Gonna keep a few of the warts in there, but not many. The rain's gonna wash a lot of those off. Still got a little bit of a ring on this one. The concentric zones around the ring here. So this one's getting pretty old. I most frequently find Amanita muscaria in white pines here. Uh, I've read that you can also find them in oaks sometimes, but every time I've ever found them, it's been in white pines. These are a young chlorophyllum molybdites, or the vomiter, the sickener, are some common names for it. Green spored parasol is also another name for it. These are very young right now, but they often grow in these fairy rings in yards because their mycelium begins in the middle here and then just grows outward in a circle. But you can tell these apart from other mushrooms because these have the brown scales on the cap. The greenish yellowish looking stem there um, they're white inside whenever you cut them open they'll have a, a ring around the stem whenever they open up but the most important characteristic to being able to identify chlorophyllum molybdites is that they have green spore prints so whenever these open up and they drop their spores they'll have white gills but they'll have green spore prints so i'll get one of those to show you
this board print is uh, it's a few days old now but it's still very much green on this white paper it's kind of a darker olive green now but it was a little bit lighter whenever it first dropped but this is the green spore print of chlorophylla molybdites she got this little rough shaped guy it's even puffing these are known as Scleridoma citronum or the poison pig skin puffball. You usually find these growing on top of moss that's growing on top of roots or something like that. These appear to be growing terrestrially, but they're probably just growing from woody debris here on the ground. But when we cut these bad boys open, they're going to be black on the inside. All right, here we go. Cut it right down the middle here. Oh, wow. Look at that. Gorgeous. All that black inside of there, that's going to be the spores. As this thing becomes older and becomes more like a puffball, uh, it'll form a hole in the top of the, the puffball, the round body here, and these black spores will start to puff out. I've already broken this one open here. You'll see a little bit more spongy and light inside. But these are a poisonous species, and typically I hear about dogs that eat these more than anything. they got this very scaly skin on the outside. And you can see the skin, or the peridium, I believe it's called, it's pretty thick compared to a normal puffball. A normal puffball might be like one millimeter or so. This right here, we're looking at two, maybe three millimeters on this bad boy. As they get older, you may find these little things on the ground here where they've already busted open. And they look almost like cup fungus and can be mistaken for cup fungus. But just look how thick the skin is. Look at the bumpy outside there. And you'll recognize that hopefully as the scleridoma citrum. So the first poison that I wanted to talk about, the first toxin I wanted to talk about within these mushrooms is the amatoxins. Uh, amatoxins can be found in section phyloidea with the destroying angels, the great felt scare dominated and the death cap, which is found uh, under lo lolly pine I've read in Virginia, the, the death cap. Uh, Gallerina marginata, uh, the funeral bell. It's in Foliotina rugosa or Conostabi phalaris, whichever name you know might know that by, as you've seen earlier. Um, it's also sometimes found in Lepiota species. And this death occurs because of liver or kidney failure. Uh, initial symptoms start 6 to 24 hours after ingestion. Then there's a period of what seems to be uh, recovery that could last 12 to 24 hours. And then after this, uh, your symptoms come back and are even worse. You know, it could lead to jaundice, coma, uh, and eventually death. Uh, it is treatable, but it's, it's pretty rigorous. With muscarine, you're going to find these in Inosobaceae, the fiber caps. Uh, some of the genus in the Inosobaceae that we find in our area are Pseudosperma, uh, Inosabi, uh, Malasabi, and Inosperma. Clytosabi species or funnels, uh, they're sometimes found uh, in this area and, and can have muscarine. Omphalotus eludens or the jack o' lantern mushroom. Entoloma species, also known as pink gills, not to be confused with the deer mushroom which also have pink gills, or agaricus, which sometimes have pink gills as well, uh, and mycena species, or bonnets. Um, Almanita muscaria can have muscarine in very, very low quantities, um, not usually enough to harm people, but it is still there, and some people have had uh, muscarine poisoning syndrome because of ingestion of Almanita muscaria. Death usually occurs because of respiratory or central nervous system failure. Some of the symptoms that come with this, you know, are blurred vision, increased salivation, um, abdominal cramping, gastric acid secretion, diarrhea, etc. Uh, whenever dogs eat any of these, uh, that's what people will notice is the excessive salivation. <laughs> symptoms can start 15 minutes to two hours after ingestion. Um, and death can occur in as early as eight to nine hours uh, after ingestion. Some miscellaneous toxins include orelanine, which is in the quaternary species or web caps, some of those. Uh, gyromitrin and monomethylhydrazine, which is found in Gyromitia uh, esculenta or false morel. Uh, glycoprotein glyco antigens found in Paxos involutus or the brown roll realm. Polyporic acid found in Hapilopilus nigilans or the tender nesting polypore. Uh, Illidans MNS are another toxin that are inside the Omphalotus Illidans, or the jack o' lantern. Phyloidin, phyloidin uh, in Amanita phyloides is in the death cap. 
and ibotenic acid or muscimol found in the muscaria variants of Amanita and in section pantherinae. So some of the stuff that can come with these different toxins, orline, uh, death can occur because of kidney failure uh, with gyromitrin, uh, comes multiple organ failure with the glycoprotein antigens, autoimmune reaction with hemolysis, however that's pronounced, which is red blood cells exploding. That sounds terrifying. Polypork acid leads to kidney or liver failure and perhaps even more scary brain damage uh, can occur with, with those. Illidan's MS, um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, headache, feelings of exhaustion, weakness, etc. Uh, that's not typically a deadly uh, mushroom. That's just one of the ones that's poisonous. We're not going to want to eat it anyways because this is what can happen. The phalloidin, if you know the imatoxins in the Amanita phalloides don't kill you, then you're going to experience some pretty severe GI upset, likely. Um, and then the ibotenic acid muscimol, the stuff found in the Amanita muscaria or the Amanita section pantherinae, you know, it's going to give you GI upset, central nervous system, excitation, or depression.